Welcome. Thank you, Aaron. It's good uh, to be back. Good, good to have you here, and yeah. good to to have you as part of of uh, of Sanfun Sangha or Social Thought. So uh, perhaps the most direct. Uh, translation. So we are filming this uh, with a live audience, um, and uh, that means that if we we're going to take questions at some time, uh, if you want to ask a question, please please uh, raise your hand and wait for the mic. Um, if and pr- present yourself. If you don't like to 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 to, to know uh, people to know who you are. Uh, don't <laughs> don't don't raise your hand because this will be this will be filmed uh, and 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 be part of of Savotanka, uh, available uh, at at the internet and, and please uh, any questions uh, ask them as questions uh, and 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 brief but but first we're going to 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 discuss um, uh, a lot of uh, a number of topics today I think. Mm-hmm. Um, our main uh, subject is uh, the morality of capitalism, and and really, um, I think to, to to many people, uh, the main force of capitalism, free markets, isn't morality. Mm-hmm. It's the ability to produce wealth, and we have had this incredible wealth uh, engine going on for at least two hundred years. Uh, but to many people, um, the the the, the Distributional re- results are not just, um, and so. But but you claim that it is the moral aspects of capitalism that is really the, the major case for capitalism. How's Absolutely, uh, and 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 I think one of the reasons we're losing capitalism, that is, capitalism, I think, is in decline globally in the world all around us, is because. Its defenders are focused only on the economics and have kind of accepted the morality of its opponents. Uh, I think capitalism is the only moral system because if if morality, as I see it, is about human flourishing, it's about individual human flourishing. It's about individuals having the ability to make choices for themselves, pursuing their own values, using their own mind to figure out what kind of life they want to live and living that life, then capitalism is the system that protects their ability to do that. It's not primarily an economic system. Capitalism primarily is a political social system. And it's a system that basically relegates the government to a very narrow job. And that narrow job is to protect us. Protect us from crooks and criminals and terrorists and invaders and fraudsters, importantly. And other than that, leave us alone. And then we all live our lives based on our own mind in pursuit of our own values, trying to achieve our own happiness. That's what morality to me means is, is, is individuals living their life based on their own terms in pursuit of their own happiness. That's what morality is. And what capitalism is a political system that allows you to do that, leaves you free to do that. Every other political system wants to impose on you certain values, certain standards, tell you what you should or shouldn't be doing with your life and whose happiness you should be pursuing. And I think think that's morally corrupt. I don't think you can impose morality on people. I don't think you should use force and coercion uh, to uh, to achieve your vision uh, of the world. And remember, government, government sounds like a nice word. And I'm all for government. I'm not an anarchist. That might disappoint some of you in the audience. I'm not an anarchist. Government is force. Government is a gun. Just, if you're not sure, try to not follow the law and suddenly a gun comes out and off you go to jail so government is forced coercion law is not optional once a law is passed no options you have to do it so um, I, I think that morality demands that we not use force against one another even if we vote for it I think morality demands that we leave individuals free to pursue their own values not impose values on them but a lot of people would see the capitalism, uh, uh, capitalist system as one that's producing a lot of inequality, uh, arbitrary income distributions, which needs to be fixed. Even if they accept your your point about pursuing your own values, yeah. uh, they would they would claim 
the, the, the result, the income result is, is not just... Uh, well, how does one apply justice to income? What is the standard? And, and, and again here, I think conventional morality out there says that the standard is some form of equality of outcome. Why? Why should people be equal in outcome? And there's, I don't know, any objective reason for that to happen. I mean, you look around this room, we're a pretty different bunch of people. Uh, we have different talents, different skills, different abilities, probably different levels of morality. Uh, some of us are ambitious and hardworking. Some of us might be lazy. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, why should the outcome be the same for us? And I think it goes to, to one of the points you made, which is um, arbitrary distribution of, of wealth. Or, or It's not arbitrary at all. You know, the, the, the distribution of wealth is determined by what you produce. You produce, you have stuff. You don't produce, you don't have stuff. Seems just to me, right? It seems just that I get my stuff, you get your stuff. I don't have a right to take your stuff. You don't have the right to take my stuff. You'll produce a little maybe, I'll produce a lot, or I'll produce a little, you produce a lot. Why does anybody care how much somebody else produces? And the beauty of the system is, that the only way for me to make money, the only way for me to become rich, to become part of that 1% or whatever, however we want to define it, is by making your lives better. There's no other way to do it. How, do, how, do, how, does, how does Apple make money? It's the biggest company in the world, or second biggest, maybe the Saudis are the biggest, but how does Apple make money? By selling me a product that I want at a price that I think it's worth it because the iPhone is worth more to me than the thousand dollars I give up for it. I celebrate when I buy a new iPhone. I don't, oh God, I lost a thousand dollars. When I lose it in the stock market, ugh, I lost a thousand dollars. But when I buy an iPhone, I'm like, I'm happy. I got something that's worth more to me than the thousand dollars I gave up. And Apple is happy because they just made a really nice profit off of me, right? We're both happier. The world is better because Apple made the iPhone and made a profit and traded with me. They got rich. I didn't get richer, but I got more fulfilled. I got more potential at my fingertips. I got more music to listen to. I got, you know, I, I, I got an iPhone, which is a value to me. I, I can give a two-hour lecture on why the iPhone is a value to me, but put that aside. But it's... it it. It really is. Otherwise, I wouldn't have given up the money. So the only way to, to, to achieve this is to drive everybody up. And, and indeed, that's the history of capitalism to the extent that we've practiced it. Inequality increases, but the poor get richer fast. Indeed, the only system in all of human history to eradicate poverty is capitalism. It's it's you know to the extent that we practice it private property and 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 freedom of contract and people buying and selling stuff based on what they want that is the only way to alleviate poverty there is no other way and what i care about what you should care about is poverty quality of life standard of living it shouldn't be relative it should be are there poor people but basically what you're saying is that Market tr transactions are not zero sum; they have plus sum. So everybody win -win. gains. It's their win-win. How is it that that uh, so many people see the market and other interactions as zero sum? Is there a good explanation of this? <sighs> I, I, <laughs> I think uh, I think economics professors have done a very bad job explaining it. Um, I think our politicians have an incentive to present it as zero sum because they want to play us off of each other. Uh, and I think that, unfortunately, thinking is an achievement, and a lot of people never achieve it. Um, and, and the reality is there are a lot of people out there who don't think. We, we want to think well of our fellow man, but, but a lot of people just don't engage in it. They have the capacity. Everybody has the capacity. But all they, all they have is a, you know, there's a perceptual level uh, that, Uh, you know, human beings have, that all animals have, we see what's happening. And what we see is iPhone $1,000. And we think the two, 
you know, equivalent. And then we see Apple getting richer. And I didn't get richer because my the value I got from the iPhone is, you could argue, spiritual. It's not material. And the whole, you know how, how, um, how Piketty measures, you know, Piketty is the French economist who wrote the book about, think about how he measures inequality, right? He measures inequality by looking at my bank account. Right? I have X amount of money in my bank account. Apple has a lot more money in, my, in their bank account. So they're richer than me. And every time I buy an iPhone, I get poorer, according to Piketty and according to most economists. Because my bank account goes down by $1,000. There's nothing in his equations that includes the, the value of the iPhone to me. It, what we call in economics consumer surplus is not captured in, the, in, in it. So I just look like I keep consuming stuff and getting poorer. And the manufacturers keep getting richer. But that's bizarre. And, and I'll give you the, my favorite example for this is because, you know, I don't know. There are not that many young people here. But how many of you have read Harry Potter? I mean, a few of you have read, well, actually, some of the older people have read Harry Potter. That's good. I mean, Harry Potter is terrible because <laughs> Harry Potter led to J.K. Rawlings becoming a billionaire. And I became much poorer because of Harry Potter. I don't know about you, but I had to buy three copies of every book because both my sons wanted one and I had to buy one for myself. And then there were rides in, in, you know, in the uh, theme parks and there, what were they, seven, nine, 12 movies that we had to go see all of them. I spent like $3,000 on Harry Potter. I got poor, poorer by $3,000. J.K. Rollins beca- became a billionaire. That's not fair. And Piketty would say inequality exploded. She was, went from a welfare recipient to a billionaire. How horrible is that? And I got poor. And that seems like zero sum. Because a lot of us got poor because we all bought the books. But how do we measure as economists, and this is the challenge that we have, how do we measure the satisfaction of reading your children a book or watching your kids in this day and age actually read a book or going to the movies with your kids or doing all that? How do you measure that? There's no measure, but that's the win on my side. The win is the spiritual satisfaction of reading Harry Potter. And she won as well. Good for J.K. Rollins. I mean, that's wonderful. So we have a challenge of explaining that because it's not perceptual. The benefit I get, and this is why I think Harry Potter example is a good example because everybody's read it and understands the value they got, but they never think of it in terms of economics. But it's all part of it. And Piketty and those economists pull one over on us because they show us statistics, which is missing the most important feature. What I got out of all the stuff that I've bought. I have, you know, if you buy artwork and you get enormous spiritual value of artwork, you got poorer, I tell you. And you go, well, no, not really. Not if you count my spiritual well-being. And, and so the whole inequality debate is bogus. There is no issue. There's no problem. There's no reason to discuss it. We need to explain the basic economics and how, as people get wealthier, and if we are participating, and it's important, because participating means we're working, we're producing something, then we all get richer at different f- speeds. But why do you care about how fast somebody else gets rich? So, um, we, we, we were talked that we've talked been talking about. Uh, about the consequences of the market and we can see the beneficial consequences. And this is a fairly standard economic mm-hmm. uh, approach to, to, to many economists at, uh, at, at least. But you would also talk about the the, the, the uh, rights embodied in the market economy as, as, as right, even as perhaps as natural rights. And would you, would, would you start that uh, from, from that point or would you start from the simple benefit of, of uh, making mutual exchanges as we've been talking about. In my view is you have to do both. And it's not so much important that you, where you start, it's, it's, it's that you cover it all. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, we all say there's a benefit to these transactions and we're all better off. But better off by what standard? Right? If you hold a morality or a conception of society that says everybody has to be equal, then we're not better off. Because we're unequal. Now, you, you should then question the morality of why should we all be equal. 
I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea why we should all be equal. I, I've never heard an explanation philosophically why we should all have equal outcomes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so philosophy is going to drive what the objective function is, right? What am I striving towards? Right now, in the United States, for example, take a very controversial issue, right? There are people who say it's not about even equality of outcome. It's about penalizing people whose forefathers had advantages and benefiting people whose forefathers had disadvantages. So if you're white, you have to be disadvantaged because you once oppressed black people and you had an advantage and now we have to give them an advantage. You know, so why? <laughs> I didn't oppress anybody. Why am I a victim, right? Why, why should I be oppressed now? But it, it, it's not an individualistic approach. It's a collectivistic approach throughout history, a tribalistic approach. So that's the level at which we need to challenge it. Is tribalism good? Is collectivism good? And if we're for individualism, rights, individual rights, property rights, then are individual rights and individualism good? And if we can't make the argument that individualism is good, that individual rights is good, then we can make the economic arguments, and we're brilliant at that. I mean, we're really good at that. And even there, it's hard, right, as, as we illustrated a minute ago. But then they'll just tell us the objective function is different. The goal is different. And we have to... So my view is that the, the liberty movement, the, the free market movement has failed to make the more fundamental argument about individualism, about, uh, about individual rights, about the morality of pursuing your own happiness, about self-interest. And this is the great contribution of Ayn Rand. I think Ayn Rand's real contribution to the movement and to the debate and to the discussion is as a philosopher talking about self-interest, which is at the heart of every capitalist transaction, uh, individualism, and individual rights as the individual rights is really the key concepts politically in how you form a government and how you create a, a proper moral government of, of defending the, the rights of individuals. So until we realize that the individual is really it, it's what matters, it, it's, it's morally the only unit that is relevant, um, we're going to have a hard time. If we buy into collectivism, we will lose. So how, how important are ideas? Um, is it, how important is it that people understand yeah. this idea in particular or that they understand the ideas behind the market order in general uh, perhaps in a consequentialist way uh, compared to institutions for instance do we have an, uh, any uh, yeah I mean I, I think it's all about ideas because I think at the end of the day our institutions are a reflection of the ideas that we have and not the uh, not the other one now there's a symbiotic relationship If you have bad institutions, it's harder to get the ideas into a culture. And part of getting the ideas into a culture is to build the right institutions that reinforce. But it starts with ideas. Um, and it ends with ideas. That is, that's true on the bad side as well. That is, the, 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 the antagonists of freedom and free markets, I think, also starts with ideas. And, and you can see that uh, in history. You can see how history is being shaped by ideas. Um, you know, there's a... Ayn Rand had this notion uh, that, uh, in a sense, civilization has been, uh, is, or, or the history of the West has basically been a struggle between two philosophers, two sets of ideas, and that's Plato and Aristotle. And as you can map out pretty much all of human, all of the West's ups and downs from Greece till today, by who get who is more dominant, who is more influential. I mean, Plato basically says. You live in a cave. You don't really see reality. You're not really, can't be really responsible for yourself. You need guidance. You need help. The philosopher king who sees the actual reality, sees the light, he needs to guide you. He needs to tell you what to do. If you read the Republic, every aspect of your life should be guided, should be informed by an expert, by somebody who actually knows. And, and it's all for your, for your own good, right? Because you're just not able to take care of yourself. This is Plato. And, and think about life in Europe before the Enlightenment. Did you choose who to marry? No. Somebody decided for you. Did you choose what religion to have? Pretty much not. You were born into religion. You stuck with it. That was it. Right? And and they you not question that. You're in big trouble. 
right? I mean, big trouble. Uh, do, do, do you make big new discoveries to change? Well, no. I mean, because you got to get it, you got to get a permission. The authorities again, you need to get you need it. You need them to sign off because you don't want to change. You know, they are the authorities, the the, the Palasa kings, however you define them. Did you choose your profession? No, you did what your dad did, or again, you had to get permission from somebody. It was a permission society. Everything had to be by permission, by permission of call them philosopher kings. And what the Enlightenment is, this revolution, it says, no. I mean, in that sense, it's an Aristotelian revolution. It says, no, every individual has the capacity to reason. We all can take care of ourselves. We have a mind. And the entity that reasons is the individual. There's no group consciousness. We know reason as a, as a collective. All that matters is the individual. And therefore, if the individual can reason, it can understand the world out there. If, if truth does not rely on ancient books and authorities, but on observation and science, then we don't need ancient books and authorities. We get to decide what's true. We get to decide what career to pursue. We get to decide who to marry. We get to decide who our political leaders are. Freedom. Or oh, political freedom. And that's the revolution. That's the West. That's what the West is. The West is Aristotelian in that sense. It's about the individual's capacity to think for himself, to take care of himself, and therefore he has the political right to be free to do so. That's the West. And every other force out there that's trying to collectivize us, trying to, subs to, to make reason subservient, trying to enforce authority on us is, in that sense, anti-Western. Uh, and and belongs to Plato, and we should reject Plato. Interesting. So it's ideas, and then we build. Just just to finish that. We build institutions to reflect that. So in the Enlightenment, you know, the American founders start with what do the American founders start with? They start with ideas, and then they build institutions to perpetuate those ideas. So today in America, we still have those institutions, eh, somewhat, kinda, not exactly. The institutions were so good that they started with that even though today nobody understands, including justices in the Supreme Court and all our politicians, every single one of them, not a single one of them understand the founders and understand what they intended by creating these inst institutions, they still do a decent job. Not a great job, but a decent job, even though nobody gets it because the institutions perpetuate the ideas. But you have to have some ideas in order to build the institutions and, and I think America is a good example because they start with ideas. And the Enlightenment generally is a good example because the Enlightenment is all about ideas. But especially being both an Israeli <laughs> originally and, and, and now an American citizen, uh, isn't, it, uh, isn't it striking to you how important a constitution can be? I mean... Uh, there's a lot of conflicts, uh, political conflict in the U.S. It is, seems to be be reduced by by institutions. Whereas in Israel, uh, this, as I understand it, there's no constitution. Yep. There's been a huge uh, conflict be between the various levels of Absolutely. governments. Uh, so, so I agree completely. I mean, constitution is incredibly important. Institutions are important, but it's the right institutions don't cre create it unless you have the right ideas. So in America, as I said, the founders had the right ideas, created the right institutions. Now we no longer have those ideas. The institutions keep us going. We still are relatively free because of the institutions. Israel doesn't have a constitution, but why doesn't it have a constitution? Because it never had the ideas. Israel was a mishmash created by disparate people with various ideas who came together not over an ideological vision for the future, but over an ethnic, you could argue, self-defense necess necessity. They, Jews were being killed, still are, um, uh, everywhere. And, and, and the sense was, and this is, if you go back to the founder of Zionism, um, uh, Herzl, his sense, he was an assimilated Jew from Vienna, completely assimilated, didn't consider himself Jewish until the Dreyfus trial. And then Dreyfus trial was a famous trial of a, of a French uh, colonel, I think, who was tried for treason, but it was all driven by anti-Semitism. Herzl observed that, said, we'll never be safe. Jews will never be safe in Europe, even though I don't consider myself a Jew. They consider me one. We need an, our own place. And, and when the British offered Uganda to the Jews, Herzl voted for it. 
He wasn't even attached to any particular land. He just wanted a place where Jews could protect themselves because everybody hates them. Um, so it, it, that was the vision of Israel. Now, if you have an ethnocentric state, what institutions do you build? And, you know, the one institution you build is, is maybe a right of return, right, which Israel has. But you don't, you don't know how to build a constitution because what principles? The founders of Israel, Ben Guyon and the other founders of Israel, basically f- were former communists who had moderated to be just regular socialists, but committed <laughs> once, real socialists. And they had to team up with religious political parties, just like they do today, uh, because they represented a, a, an important constituency. And with a right, a nationalist right wing, um, uh, you know, and they had a somehow the socialists and the religionists, the social atheists, Ben Gurion was an atheist, and they had to team up with the religionists and the nationalists somehow. How could you write a constitution? And indeed, they recognized that they couldn't write a constitution early on, and they and, and uh, they muddled through. And Israel still, in terms of uh, judiciary and in terms of the system of government and everything else, still muddles through, and it's it's a tragedy. But in that sense, America is very unique. America is the only country in history created around an idea. Most countries just just are there. But America was created with a particular idea in mind and a particular system of government, a particular constitution. Later on, countries created constitutions, but they weren't created around a, a, uh, a an, an institution or an idea. Yeah, and and, and the history of conflict, uh, conflict with within the, the British Empire, and uh, uh, so, so they, 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 they and, and a unique moment in time because if you think about the Enlightenment as being the 18th century. America is kind of the, the, the peak, the, the, the crowning achievement, politically at least, of the Enlightenment. And all these people were trained with the Enlightenment. They had Enlightenment ideas. They were all reading. I mean, if you, if you look at what, who they cite in the Federalist Papers and when they're talking to one another, I mean, they're citing the French, Voltaire, and particularly Montesquieu they cite a lot. They're, they're obviously citing John Locke and, and the Scottish Enlightenment. These are real intellectuals. How often do we get politicians who are real intellectuals who real thinkers, real innovators, and original, and who care, who really care about freedom and liberty and, and creating the right kind of institutions that will survive generations. So here you had a very unique point in history, and, it, and it's why I think there's a sense in which everybody should celebrate kind of American independence because everybody's benefited from that unique combination because those ideas spread then to the rest of the world and a lot of other countries emulated to one extent or another the the the, the ideas and therefore the institutions of of uh, of the United States but Israel Israel would have been worse off if if they had tried to 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 start out writing a constitution it could it make sense it be sort of starting out a new country <laughs> uh you know I think the, they would have been worse off coming? because the compromises they would have made would have been horrific. And uh, so uh, you have an element, which is a minority in Israel, uh, of religionists who want to impose religion on everybody. Um, and, and it's bad. I mean, really bad. Not, you know, these are not moderate religionists. These are... Um, on a secular society. Israel is a secular society and was a secular society. And yet they wouldn't sign up for the Constitution unless they had got their, I don't know, no work on Sabbath and you can't drive a car and we're, we're still, I don't know, all, mm-hmm. all the all the stuff that they would want. And then what do you do about the socialists? I mean, there's a sense in which I'm glad Ben Gurion didn't write the Constitution because I don't think Israel would be Israel today, right? So Israel is a startup nation. It has the, 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 you know, more entrepreneurs than any place in the world except Silicon Valley. Per capita, it, 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 it has massive GDP growth out of technology and innovation. Would a socialist constitution protect that? Or would it crush that? And I feel it would have crushed it. Now, it would be nice if today they could sit down and write a constitution, but you have the same, you don't have socialists anymore. Israel, there's no left in Israel. There's no real left in Israel. Everybody's a center Uh, there's no real capitalism either, but everybody's kind of in the center. And in most of the disagreements in Israeli politics, almost all the disagreements in Israeli politics are about personalities. They're not about ideas. They're all basically idea and big picture. They all agree, except for religion, which is a separate thing, and personalities. Uh, so it would be nice if today they could do it and marginalize the religionists. And, and there probably is a majority that could do that. But they, you know, they don't have... 
the guts and they don't have and they don't have the moral authority to marginalize religion and as long as religion ha- ha- is an overlay how do you write a constitution with you know judaism like you know maybe more like islam than, than christianity judaism the core of judaism is a lack of separation of church and state that you know church and state are one and and the religionists secular israelis don't think that but the religionists want power political power and it's it's a challenge so i don't expect to see a constitution in israel i i, I expect to see this fighting going on and netanyahu made a massive political mistake by taking by doing judicial reform instead of doing kind of moderate reform everybody agreed that the judiciary was screwed up and it needed reform but he went all the way and you know they could have there was easily easily could have been a compromise there but uh for political reasons they never achieved it and and i think uh, I, I i think hamas took advantage of that okay maybe we should uh uh explain to our listeners just a little bit about the conflict in, in israel uh um the, uh, the conflict between the 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 government and the just the judiciary so Yeah, so quickly, um, because Israel has no constitution, it, it, you know, the, the the role of the Supreme Court in Israel is ambiguous. It, it's determined by, in a sense, the the, judici- the um, legislature is going to decide by law what the role of the Supreme Court. But so, and, and it, there's a sense, in, so Israel passed a few years ago, a couple of decades ago, it passed basic laws, which are kind of a pseudo constitution but not really mm. everything's kind of implicit nothing's actually explicit and what has happened over the last 20 years is given that basic law and given the political constant political fighting in israel it's a coalition governments like you have and in a sense a, a lack of um separation between the executive branch the government and the legislative branch because coalition governments you don't really have that separation in america there's a clear separation between executive and legislature the judiciary in israel has evolved over the last 20 years to have a bigger and bigger and bigger role role in in you know eliminating laws saying laws are, are they can't say they're not constitutional so then against the basic law they're against human rights so they're you know they have A, a, a certain view which is the role of the judiciary in a properly functioning um, market the problem the fundamental problem is who is in the judiciary does not reflect who is in the government or does not reflect who the, the Israeli people are voting for so the judiciary is the only part of Israeli society in which the left really dominates because the judiciary is elected by the judiciary they vote themselves their own replacements mm-hmm. and then they can overturn a law based on their interpretation of the basic laws uh, and the, the legislature and the and executive can't do anything about it and they can't appoint different judges when there's a cha- political change in the country like in the United States Republicans appoint judges that lean more Republican and Democrats in Israel you can't do that because the judiciary controls itself so you get a bunch of leftists to begin with they just perpetuate leftism in the judiciary so what Netanyahu tried to do was to try to counter that this latest government and the way to keep the way they wanted to counter it is to give all the power to the government <laughs> so to eliminate any kind of so instead of saying okay we need to come up with a better way to choose judges maybe maybe the the maybe the legislator will the legislature should choose judges by a majority vote or even a super majority vote in 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 the united states for many years you needed 60 senators to appoint a supreme court judge no more that was eliminated now it's 51 but it used to be 60 maybe maybe something like that some kind of super majority so you get judges that 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 reflect more kind of the the, the politics uh, but no they didn't do that they basically gave the government not even the, the legislature the government the authority to appoint judges And everybody says, well, wait a minute, then we have like, uh, now we don't have any separation of powers. We have the government running everything. Um, they said, okay, the Supreme Court can never overrule a law. So if they do overrule a law, the the legislature by one vote can overturn what the Supreme Court did. Well, then what exactly is the point of having the Supreme Court look at laws if 
if they can be just overturned by one vote, again, super majorities make sense here. Or maybe you can't overturn a Supreme Court decision. You have to change the law, which is wh- how it's done in America. America, if the Supreme Court says a law is unconstitutional, you have to change the law you, 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 or, or dump it, but you can't just override what the Supreme Court says. Um, so things like that, which gave, which concentrated power all in the, uh, all in the government, so in the legislature, which reminds people of Poland and of Hungary in terms of the, the, the political control over many of these branches of government, which is, is not a healthy trend, not a healthy trend. So, oh, I, I won't comment on Denmark because I don't know, <laughs> but I'll, I believe you. So, so, so the idea is if, we had a con- if Israel had a constitution, then you would explicitly have a rule for the judiciary, and then when the judiciary ruled the law was no good, it would have a basis to do it. It would have the constitution as a reference point. But the constitution has to be good. Mm. If it's a bad constitution, then the wrong laws get overturned. And so you have to have a good constitution. And my fear, my fear is that if, it, if Israel got together today to create a constitution, it would not be a good one. My fear is the worst thing that can happen in America today would be a constitutional convention where they change the constitution. I mean, a lot of conservatives in America want to change the constitution. They want to have a constitutional convention and have and change the constitution. And that to me is the worst possible nightmare because with all due respect to conservatives in America, they have no conception of the founding fathers. Founding fathers were not conservative. They were radical revolutionaries. Uh, so uh, uh, the, 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 the new constitution would be a lot worse than the old one. I think, unfortunately, that, that would be true for Denmark as well. Yes. Uh, there's some talk about uh, rewriting our constitution to have rights for the environment and uh, climate and, and well, so on written does, into the constitution. Doesn't the European constitution uh, have 320 rights or something like that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just, it, yeah, it's absurd. And yeah. I mean, it, it, rights are really, really important concept and there really is only one right. There's one right and that is a right to your life. And what that means is that you have the freedom to live your life based on your judgment in pursuit of your values to achieve your goals. And basically, as long as you don't use coercion, fraud on other people, none of anybody's business what you do. That's it. That's the only right that exists. And everything else is a derivative. You have a right to free speech. Well, because... What does it mean to live if not to express yourself and to write and to, to be intellectual? You have a right to liberty for, for the same reason. You have a right to property because property is, is what you do while living is you, you create wealth. You create, you, you know, build stuff. You make stuff. It's yours because you did it. Um, but it all derives from the right to life, that, that one right. And uh, this proliferation of rights is absurd. You said that Hamas use the opportunity uh should we could you briefly go into uh so to 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 your view on on the, the present crisis in in sure. Israel? i very much think that hamas timed this because they they did it when they did it for for a number of reasons one is uh, israel has seen the biggest divisions within israel and the biggest conflict internally in its history i mean these demonstrations were massive Uh, you know, a lot of Israelis were saying, we're not going to the, we're not going to, if the reserves call us, we're not going, right? Uh, unheard of in Israel, right? Uh, Israel's, a, Israel's a country where people are super patriotic and, 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 and would always go. Uh, so, so there was a real tear in Israeli society. And it was clearly, Israel was weak. It, it was weak at that point. I think second, um, There was a lot of conflict, artificial conflict, created by this government in the West Bank. There was probably unnecessary, uh, but that, that it was created there, which had caused the government to move a lot of its troops to the West Bank. And in a sense, leave Ga- the Gazan border relatively unprotected. So a lot of those troops were in the West Bank and not easily available. And third... It, by all accounts, Israel was about to sign a, a peace deal with Saudi Arabia. Now, this is a big deal, right? I, I mean, I have doubts about these peace deals, but from the context of geopolitics, these, this is a big deal. Mm. The, 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 you know, Saudi Arabia is a big supporter of Hamas, always has been financially in every other sense, morally, certainly. 
uh, it, you know, it's 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 the uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, the Holy Land in a sense that uh, Mecca and Medina are in Saudi Arabia. It is the guardian of the holy sites for them to cut to deal with a Jewish state in, in the Middle East is horrific and, and devastating to the Islamists of the world. And and people forget Hamas is not just a political entity. Hamas is, is part of a widespread Islamic jihadist uh, movement. It's religious. It's 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 fundamentalist. It's uh, it's not just political. This is a theocracy, and they run the Gaza Strip as a theocracy. So religion is really really crucial to them. So uh, they wanted to destroy the peace deal with the Saudis. They they wanted to catch Israel at a moment of weakness. They could see fewer troops on the border. Now exactly how it happened. Exactly why Israel failed to the extent that it did, I think we're going to have to wait months to figure out. I mean, the intelligence failure, the military failure, um, the failure of the technology, right? Israel was supposed to be able to tell if a mouse moved, and, and never mind a thousand people ramming through a fence. The logistics failure on Israel's side of not getting troops in time to the places... All of that, there'll be commissions, they'll talk about that for years. Biggest military political failure, uh, uh, intelligence failure in Israel's history. It makes the Yom Kippur War seem like, a, uh, like nothing in comparison uh, to, the, to the magnitude of this failure. And I, you know, I served in military intelligence um, a long, long time ago. And it's hard for me to, to, to what were they doing? It's, it's hard for me to get what they were doing. A lot of it is the same symptom as Yom Kippur War in 73. They were cocky. They, they, they thought they had it all, and they were like too heavily in technology. All the sensors, the, ga- the, the, the fences. It, this is a, a warning to people who think walls protect you. Ask Rome if a wall protected them. Ask any castle in Europe if the wall protected them. Ask Israel if the fence protected them. Walls don't protect you. Um, we talk about what does, but walls don't. Uh, Israel felt too secure, but there's a lot of, actual things that happened that will be analyzed uh, you know and, and then we can talk about the political long term political failure uh, but that that might be a, that's a longer story what's going to happen next is this conflict going to spread uh... so I, I, so I think right now you've got two forces in play uh, that are that are that, that are challenged um, Israel which is which seems to be really committed to eliminating Hamas for the first time, I'd say 20 years too late, but uh, really 20 years too late, and they've had every opportunity, every reason to do it way back in the past, But and that's the main cause of what happened, is, is Israel's constant appeasement of Hamas and the Palestinians more broadly for the last uh, 30-plus years. But um, so Israel, who wants to act, and, and I think if you interview the soldiers on the border, they're all eager to get it on, you know, to, to, to go in there and, 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 and bring justice. And, um, and then you've got the U.S. And the U.S. wants to tell everybody they really want Israel to be strong and really want Israel to go in there. And, but the U.S. is much more concerned about a broader conflict. The U.S. is concerned about its relationship with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states and, you know, All you have to know about the U.S. is this. I think this says everything about U.S. foreign policy over the last, I don't know, since World War II probably, but certainly in the Middle East over the last 50 years. The U.S. has its largest military base in the Middle East, its largest airfield in the Middle East, and its command center for the entire Middle East and Afghanistan in Qatar. In Qatar. Qatar is where CENTCOM or whatever it's called, commands all American forces all over the Middle East all the way into South Asia Um, and it has the biggest air force Qatar is also a large and active funder of terrorism and has been since the days of Al Qaeda Um, and is a home to many of the Hamas leadership all the political leadership lives in Qatar so you literally 10 years ago you had the situation where American airplanes would take off to bomb ISIS in Iraq and in Syria, and money would flow from the same place, Qatar, into the coffers of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Syria. 
So America has no foreign policy. It has it has a dyslectic, uh, uh, inconsistent, completely suicidal, self-destructive foreign policy, and it's exp- exported that. It's done a very good job exporting that to Israel. And Biden went to Israel not to show support. He went to Israel for a photo op and to pretend to show support. But he basically went to Israel to twist the arms of the Israelis to, to, to make sure they moderated their response and, and did it on the timetable that Biden would decide. So you're seeing negotiations through Qatar. Qatar is negotiating with Hamas because they have the relationship after all. Uh, and the Americans to free the hostages. They'll, the, uh, Hamas will free some hostages. They will show goodwill because they will, they will play the good guys. They will do all that. They won't release all of them because it's too, too big of a card they have. They'll release some. And they'll pretend to be good guys. Uh, the United States will delay Israel and delay Israel and delay Israel. The more they delay, the harder this is going to get. Because uh, the more prepared Hamas will be, the more prepared Iran will be, the more prepared Hezbollah will be. And then the question will be, will Hamas and Hezbo- will Hezbollah and Iran join in? I think the Americans, the one thing they might do right, although I'm not sure it's right, but is... They're going to kind of deal with Israel and Iran not to join, and then in 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 exchange for reigning in the Israelis. Um, so I think this will end like every other every other of these kind of crises over the last thirty years. Israel will go in; it'll show force; it'll flex muscle; it'll do a few things; it'll kill Hamas leadership; it'll do stuff like that. Nothing will fundamentally change on the ground. Um, and, uh, and then Israel will retreat, leave uh, Gaza, Gaza, and five years from now, ten years from now, we'll have the same conversation about uh, what do we do about Hamas and what are we going to do about Gaza and why isn't Israel's going to be tough this time. This time they'll do it. Whereas, I know nobody asked me, but I'll tell you anyway. If, in my view, this is a great opportunity for uh, the United States to correct its mistakes that it's been made in the Middle East over the last 20 something years this is an up well no actually since 1979 so it's 50 50 years uh and that is this is the opportunity uh to deal with the iranians to deal with them harshly to deal with them properly uh you know and there's enough now uh, uh, civilian population in iran which is upset at the regime i don't know how much you follow the goal the 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 the, the goal revolution in iran which is I think one of the most, you know, one of the courageous and and exciting things to watch, people really caring about their freedom and willing. There was just a, a girl, just one of them was just killed um, uh, yesterday, I think, uh, because she she didn't wear uh, the hijab and she, you know, and, and uh, they haven't released the video yet, but it looks like uh, the, the, these these nuts killed her. Anyway, there's a, there's a rising demand within the Iranian population. So I don't actually think it would be that hard to support them to overthrow the current regime. And that would change the Middle East forever, really. And Iran is the problem of the Middle East. It always has been. It was before 9-11. It was after 9-11. It was, you know, it started this whole Islamist movement, really, in terms of its modern formation. It, it, as long as Iran exists in its current regime, and its current form, there will be no peace in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, so... It's an opportunity for the United States to take care of Iran. It's an opportunity for Israel to take care of Hezbollah and Hamas. And I wish they would just get out, get out, get it done. Because the longer they wait, the harder it's going to be in the future. Let's talk a little bit about the U.S. Um, the, in your, your book, uh, I think it was 10, 10 years ago, ago it came out. It's uh, the free market revolution. Yep. You were... Uh, had some hope for the Tea Party movement yep. to become a force of uh, spreading good ideas uh, about freedom and capitalism and so on. You also have some reservations yep. about it in, in the book, as I recall it. Um, and how, how do you see now? What, how, what's what's playing out in the, in the U.S. Uh, now? What's going to happen uh, in the next election and and and, and then on? Um, well, the reservations turn out to be to be more insightful than the whole. Uh, with regard to the with the Tea Party, uh, the Tea Party, um, Tea Party. If you were involved at all with the Tea Party in the U.S., it had an energy, it had an excitement to it. Mm. They had the right slogans, they had the right high level kind of ideas, without any grounding, without any understanding, without any real uh, commitment. And 
So they would they would do things like we want smaller governments, and then and then you would see people with signs saying keep your hands off of my Medicare. Right? Medicare is the largest welfare program in the United States. It's a massive redistribution of wealth. So they wanted that, but they wanted to shrink government somehow. Medicare will also become the, by far the largest program the U.S. government, far bigger than defense. It'll be the bigger. It, it already is very close, but it's going to be could be the, the largest spending program. So they had no real clue. <laughs> But they had this spirit about them, and, and that's the excitement. That's what I think. They had the spirit of, 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 I think, hearkening back to kind of American individualism, kept your hands off me, but without any content. And the hope was that some of us who tried could give them the content and help educate them to... to, to but it, but it, it couldn't be done. It, and, and, oh, at least we couldn't do it. We, we failed or... Uh, and, and partially it was because it was a superficial movement. It was an emotional movement, not a movement of ideas, not a movement of reason. It was also, and not to insult people in the room, it was also a movement of older people. It was not a movement of youth. And um, revolutions are revolutions, are activities of young people. You want to change the world, you got to get young people into the streets. You're not going to get it by getting us older go- people into the streets. We can educate we can help, we can advise, we can assist, but the revolution has to happen with young people. That, that, and I think the left understands that better than any of us and has forever. Uh, so it was, it was too old. And therefore, they were fixed in their ways and they couldn't think outside the box and they couldn't, they couldn't expand their horizons. And then finally, they were too religious. And they were captured by the religious rights in, in the U.S. Um, much more solidly than anything you know some of us free market types were trying to trying to get to them and and so basically what happened to the to the they got they they elected some people i mean you probably know i don't know marco rubio and ted cruz and and a few others that they thought were going to change america and yeah and, you know you know compromises middle of the road is at the end of the day when it comes to what's important i think to many of us and uh, so they, they, they were disheartened by that. They were disheartened by the fact that uh, uh, Obama, who they hated, they despised Obama. They were, he won in 2012, which was a shock to them. It shouldn't have been, but it was a shock to them. And they kind of fizzled away and focused almost all their energy on anger and frustration. So they became almost overwhelmingly just angry and frustrated. And this was just the perfect mix for Donald Trump. I mean, it's just, it was just, it just set it up for him. And I think Trump's real capacity, because he's, he's not very smart and he's not very able, right? But the real capacity he has is he's a great marketer. He gets his audience and he knows what to pitch them. He knows what to sell them. And he, he got a sense that this was the state of America, more so than any of us, I think, how angry Americans were. And he offered them what every tin pot authoritarian offers, an angry audience. Yeah, he's tin pot. Um, fear. You remember carnage in the streets of America? At that point, when he said that, America was the safest it had ever been in terms of murder rates, crime rates, by every rate possible, everything had declined from from the early 1990s to that point. That was the safest America had ever been. But he, carnage in the streets of America. American industries are disarray. The economy is lost. Everything everything is horrible. And it, yeah, because they were angry already. So they, yes, absolutely. Everything's horrible. And it's not your fault. You're good American people. You're patriots. It's not your fault. It's those Mexicans. <laughs> it's the... It's the Chinese, and it's the elites. And how do we solve this? Don't worry, I can solve it. I know how to do it. Now that's the formula of every kind of authoritarian-leaning politician ever in all of history, right? Fear, the other, and in America you can't say it's the fault of the Jews, so you won't win. So you blame, so you blame, you know, you blame uh, South Americans and Chinese, it's, it, but it's the same effect, right? It's the other, the scary other, the successful. And it's easy to blame China because they're successful. So and, and we're losing jobs and they're gaining jobs as if as if that's the cause, of, 
you know, assuming that causal relationship, which is not true from an economics perspective. Um, and he he captured that anger and he got it and 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 it, it rose up and he won and he won based on that. So the Tea Party became the most dedicated Trump fans. They are, and if you look at Trump fans, they tend to be older. They're very angry, and they were very active in the Tea Party. They used to be shrink government, individual rights, constitution. Now, you never hear them talk about the constitution. There's no mention of freeing markets. It's all about bashing the left. It's all about the culture wars. That's all that matters. It's getting getting rid of those Chinese and Mexicans and, and, uh, and giving Trump more power so he can do stuff. Now, he's incompetent, so when he gets power, he doesn't do anything. Uh, although the second time around, I think he'll surround himself with better, more committed people, and he'll be a lot more dangerous. He'll be a lot more dangerous. Um, so as you can tell, I don't like Trump. Um, what will happen in the next election? I don't know. I mean, I, l I never thought Trump would have a chance because he lost in 2020 in spite of what he claims. He really did lose. Mm -hmm. And he lost not because people like Biden. Nobody likes Biden. Nobody's ever liked Biden. I mean, Biden's run for president many, many times and could never get the Democratic nomination. They'll, you know, so uh, somehow he got the nomination because the Democrats are so weak. Uh, nobody likes Biden. They voted against Trump. I mean, and, and, a lot, and, and the re if you look at how many people voted in America in 2020, record numbers. I don't think uh, for 100 years. Why? Because they were motivated by hatred of Trump. And I think justifiably. But now Biden's in office and he's a disaster. And he, he you know, it's obvious that he's too old. It's obvious he, 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 he is. He now, granted, Biden was never very sharp, right? He always used to talk all over the place. But now he's really rambling and he really can't keep track of stuff. And, and the economy, is, by some measures, is doing well, but people don't feel because inflation is a, as you probably know, inflation is something people really feel. So even if, though, even if they make a little bit more money because wages are going up, they still feel like they're worse off because... So they, they don't track real wages, right, right? They don't track the stats. They track their pocketbook. Um, people don't like Biden. And they kind of remember that when Trump was around, things were kind of good. I don't think because of him, but they were kind of good. And um, I think he has a really good chance of, of winning. Uh, I, I, now, the only hope we have is that they lock him up. Um, I think he deserves to be locked up, and, but, but, I, but I, I don't know that he will be. We'll see. Uh, it's going to be, the next year is going to be the most interesting and fought with horror uh, American politics has ever had. It's never been this crazy. Because he's literally got four lawsuits, three of which he could land up in jail. One of them is a civil case, but the other three are, are criminal lawsuits. Um, and all three, there's reasonable reason to think he's guilty. All of them. And um, we'll see. But, yeah, but it's also reasonable reason to think that the left is using this politically. Okay. But, of course, the right has used it politically, too. Courts have been used in America politically for a long time. Just ask Rudolf Giuliani. Um, he was brilliant at it in the 1980s, using the courts for politics. So, you know, so it, it's it's going to be an interesting year. Um, I, you know, I, I would like to see one of the other Republicans be the candidate. I think anybody could beat Biden. And I think pretty much anybody on stage at these debates is better than Trump. Literally every single one of them is better than Trump. Both can beat Biden easier than Trump and would be a better president than Trump. But I don't count. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're saying basically is that it's it's more important to have a small group of very well-trained uh, young people uh, who are into ideas and have a large popular movement like the, the Tea Party was, even if they can nominate presidents and they, even if they can set to the agenda um i think the most important thing to have is the intellectual the the the, the, the intellectuals and the intellectuals are, are mainly speaking to young people i think again old people we get set in our ways it's hard to change your mind after i don't know 30 40 50 at some point it's really hard to change your mind about important things you get into certain thinking habits and for most people 
Um, so the, the real change is happening with young people. And they're impacted by their professors and they're impacted by the media. And the media is not this separate entity. The media is basically driven by the intellectuals, by the people who advise them and by the people they interview and by the people. So changing the world is an intellectual endeavor. It's all about intellectuals. And the left dominates that field. The, the, the right is <laughs> defaulted on it, has forever, you know, uh, uh, talented, um, you know, the story in America is talented conservatives go into business and make a lot of money and talented left-leaning people go into academia and become professors. And yet the people who go into academia are the ones who dominate the world in that. And you can see that right now on American campuses, the, the, the hysterics that are going on on American campuses right now are just are just stunning um, in terms of the Hamas, but 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 also woke and and everything else. It's and it dominates the culture. It dominates everything. So what you really need are the, is the intellectual high ground. You need to dominate the intellectual sphere. You need to dominate universities, think tanks, and and uh, and media and every way where intellect where ideas are discussed and presented. That's what you have to have a voice. And again, the reality is the left overwhelms everybody else and the, the the people i don't like to use left right anymore because i don't think i don't i don't consider myself right uh even though uh, so you know but people are free market or people who care about individual liberty they just know that we, we don't have a lot of intellectuals and the intellectuals we have are all economists and we need more than economists we really do you, you know we we need historians and political scientists and and uh and in every realm, we need we need people, philosophers and sociologists and all this stuff. We need we need people, and uh, we don't have them. We just don't have the numbers, and as a consequence, our voice is is becoming muted. And what scares me over the last, I'd say over the last, yeah, really since COVID, but really since Trump, it really started with Trump, and that is that a lot of young people who traditionally would have gone the free market route are now going the alt right. Route. And we're talking not just about the crazy kid in his mother's basement who's playing video games and tweeting alt-right nonsense or racist nonsense. We're talking about PhD students, political science students. We're talking about, in, in a, some of the, we're talking about uh, uh, institutions that used to represent America's founders and, and kind of conservatism and are now representing really bizarre forms of right-wing nationalism and and religiosity and things like that claremont institute comes to mind if you read the claremont review of books it used to be a really respectable really interesting and now it's become this you know rag of, of right-wing nuts uh and uh and with no regard to individual liberty and no regard for economics now the right wants political power to impose their va they figured the left uses political power to impose their values on us now they want to impose their values on us but those of us who believe in liberty don't want anybody to impose their values on us. So uh, um, that is a rare breed. And that really worries me. The rise of this alternative right in America, national conservatism, you see that in Europe as well, and a rise even further to the right of um, uh, integrationalists. I don't know if you have that in Europe. There's a big movement in America of integrationalists, almost all Catholics who don't believe in separation of state and church and they want to they want to bring religion into politics in America in a way that I think would be traditionally has been unheard of Patrick Deneen and there's a bunch of them um, uh, Sahib Sahab Omari uh, all converts to Catholicism none of them were born Catholic they all became Catholics and and now uh, integrationalism is the integration of religion and politics okay I think we'll Take a few questions uh, from the from the floor. Um, I think you've he's had his pen up for a long time, a very long time. So uh, <laughs> please uh, present yourself first. For sure. Uh, hi, Aaron. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a 23 year old uh, wannabe uh, politician just starting out in Sweden. Um, I'm looking around in a Danish room, and if you think it's an uphill battle here, it's a little bit worse in Sweden. Um, one of the First, I wanted also to thank you for all of these talks that have been happening around the world for the young here that have not produced enough to, to be able to travel to these conferences. Everything being on YouTube is fantastic. And um, my question to you is, my biggest difficulty that I'm experiencing 
is very much this that opened my eyes um, in in Atlas Shrugged, which was the the mixture of food and poison. The that the the mixed system keeps the bad parts alive, and to offer a, thir- a thirsty man water with poison in it, and then mixing it around and trying to take out the poison by hand, it, yep. it's <laughs> very much a difficult battle. Um, trying to start a party in Sweden uh, because of the right parties there just having been very much ceding the moral ground that you talked about uh, that they are almost apolo- apologizing for capitalism being like it it's uh, it seems to work but we don't we we they're very much ceding moral ground my question is would you like uh, would you talk to the point of when i try to talk to young people how how i would go about it <laughs> when it seems that every institution every philosophy department everything i've talked to has this mixed bag mixed system view of it and they would love to they they all say that it's it's been seeming to work to drink out of this mixed glass this whole time yeah so mixed glass you know he's talking about the mixed economy let me just say something about the cost of travel um so we're doing a conference in um march in amsterdam not far from here um uh, 23-year-olds we give a lot of scholarships out uh so including travel and everything else there are flyers for the conference back there you can look at the barcode uh it'll be a deep dive into kind of Ayn Rand's ideas of philosophy and so on so I encourage uh, everybody to come and for the young people here uh to apply for scholarships uh we are eager to get people there and that'll be in March I'll be there and so will a bunch of other people um <laughs> Yeah, so the mixed economy. Uh, the mixed economy is it makes things really, really, really hard for us to advocate for kind of laissez-faire capitalism. Partially because the mixed economy, particularly as it's practiced in, in Europe and in the United States, does a mildly okay job. So that most people are kind of comfortable. And why be radical if you're comfortable? I mean, you're asking them to change the world. And to advocate for something everybody's going to hate them for, and to and and to take a risk because there's always risk in something new, and they're comfortable, and you know and so it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge uh, to say let's get rid of all the regulations. Well, but 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 things are running. They could be a thousand times better. Oh yeah, right. That's your imagination, right? Um, you'd think they get it because the examples are kind of obvious and we get it and it's not that hard but it's very very difficult for most people to engage with radical ideas particularly from a point of comfort that's why i think a lot of these radical ideas are more popular in places that don't have it so good i I found eastern europe particularly in the past much more open to these ideas because they a remembered communism and and it wasn't that good there or south america they've tried everything fascism communism mixed everything and nothing works so they're open to something new. What the hell? Why not try it? And you'll see there's a there's a candidate in Argentina who's uh, who's this libertarian, little nuts, but he's but he's got this platform that's amazing, right? And and he's he's likely to win. It'll be the first time a libertarian gets to run a country. Now he doesn't have the parliament with him, so it's it's going to be difficult to pass the kind of legislation he needs. But why is he winning in Argentina? Because Argentina is a libertarian country? No. He's winning in Argentina because Argentinians are so fed up with everything. They're willing to take a huge gamble on some crazy nut who yells in the radio. I don't know if you've seen this guy. He yells. He screams. He swears. I mean, he's 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 one of these radio personalities. These cra- uh, uh, these shock personalities. <laughs> you know. So so, but uh, you know, taking a step back. So I don't have any particular advice in terms of what to say to people other than everything that I say, right? Uh, uh, my talks and all of that. But I, I, I would say this, and this is not meant to discourage you, but maybe it is. It's way too soon for politics. It's just, you, you're bashing your head against the brick wall. It, the culture's not, not ready for this. You know, I'm a pretty charismatic guy. I can go up on a stage and get people excited and so on. People always ask me in America, why don't you run for president? Because I'd lose in a landslide. It wouldn't even be close. Because nobody wants what we have to... It's not that we don't market ourselves well. It's not that we don't have a charismatic enough leader. It's not that we're not funny. It's not that we're not... We don't, if only we had short videos. I, I get told by donors, short videos. If you had a few short videos, the world would change. 
it doesn't work like that. This is real work, and it's going to take time. And most of the work is in the trenches, in a sense of trying to change the culture, which means trying to change the way people think. And the only way to do that is one person at a time, one individual at a time. And it takes a long time. It's, it takes work. And you need a lot of people. So the intellectual work, and, and politics can serve that as, a, as an educational platform if that's how you view it, rather than as a, oh, I have to get, because once you start focusing on getting the votes, you'll see how, how you'll start smoothing the edges and making it appear less radical and being more friendly. And I know you've had some parties here in Denmark that have done that, and, and it, 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 they, they haven't lasted in terms of real change and real reform, because they can't. So hard work. Um, hard work. I have a question here. No, Darren, go for it. Hello, Jaren. Hi. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, the Danish society? It's a little bit leftist leaning, in my view. <laughs> They are proud on paying uh, taxes and you know going after the environment. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think Danish society is is, is pretty typical of, of uh, in that sense uh, in Europe and and uh, in much of what we call the West because the left has the moral high ground. It has the moral high ground. It has the the, the intellectual high ground. It has the political high ground. And uh, you, whatever right there is is always playing defense. It's not playing offense. The right has no vision. The right has no idea. And to the extent that they have a vision, it's scary. So the right has no real vision. It has no solutions on a, that, that are appealing, that are interesting, that are particularly to young people. I mean, um, it, so it, Denmark is a product of its intellectuals, a product of, of the history of that intellectual movement. And look, the, it's not like there have been a lot of intellectuals on our side. There have been a lot of good economists on our side. But other than economists, How many intellectuals have been on our side, on the side of, again, individual liberty and laissez-faire capitalism? Not many. Uh, Ayn, Ayn Rand being one, and Ayn Rand is super controversial. Uh, and even when people read her, they often d don't understand her. And uh, But I think her ideas are crucial to this battle. I, I don't think we, to the extent that we all share a goal, can win without her because She's the one who challenges these fundamental beliefs that need to be challenged, that, that the left relies on. It relies on the idea of your happiness is not what matters, it's the group that matters. They rely on the idea that sacrifice is good. You know, they tell you uh, the greater good of the planet is more important than your ability to fly to the United States. So we'll ban flights to the United States. Nobody will be able to fly long distance. Anybody goes, yeah, well, sacrifice. You know, sometimes you have to sacrifice. And I'm like, no. I don't believe in sacrifice. But who believes that? Me and five other people, right? So it's, 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 it's this is why, you know, the, the, again, it's, it's, it's more fundamental and it's not surprising uh, where they are. And, and climate change, look, it's an ideal topic. It's got all the trappings of religion, every single trapping of religion, And it, you can gain power and you can get control. And what, who came up with this? Genius, right? Uh, of everything. Now, it, so even if it's happening, or let's assume it's happening, the catastrophizing of it is just perfect if you want to take control of people and capture their imagination. I mean, you couldn't have invented Greta. I mean, she's a work of marketing genius. And she's, she, 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 She's articulate just in the right way as to get people excited. She appeals to idealism, right? She's, a, talk about compromise. She's against compromise. Shut it down tomorrow. She doesn't care. That appeals to young people. It's about time we talk like that. Let's shut it down tomorrow. Yeah, we, we need to capture that idealism. We need to project. This is the thing that, the, that, that we have not done well. And again, I think why... Ayn Rand is like because she, you know, uh, it, it, among some of us, because of the novels. The novels project an ideal. We need ideals. We need an image of what the future looked like. We need solutions. We need big ideas. Uh, just saying, let's deregulate this a little bit, that doesn't capture the imagination of the young people. You need to talk about a grand vision of the future, which the left is very good at. And it goes back to Marx, who had this 
beautiful utopia. Never told us how we get there or how many tens of millions of people they have to kill in order to get there. But they all remember the utopia where you, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. You, you do exactly what you want. All your material needs are taken care of. How it happens, how it works, blank out. But you've got that ideal. We, we need something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is uh, Mess Strange. I'm a political advisor uh, for the Danish party Liberal Alliance, and I'm also a candidate myself for next year's election to the European Parliament. So one of the um, intellectual ideas that has uh, been very influential in the last couple of years is, you know, wokeness or leftist identity politics. Yeah. How do you think Ayn Rand would approach wokeness if she was alive today? And a quick follow-up follow -up question. Uh, is it your assessment that we'll see more or less wokeness in the uh, next 10 years? I mean, she would be horrified by it. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, much of it makes, you know how a lot of people read Alice Shrugged and they say, well, this is a caricature. Nobody talks like this. Well, wokeness makes what she writes in Alice Shrugged seem moderate as compared to how crazy some of these people are. Um, and and this is the tricky thing about wokeness. They've taken real issues, real problems. Um, racism, a real problem. Uh, trans, a real issue. Uh, sexuality, all these things are real issues. And real issues that we need to do some thinking about. We need, we need to solve. We need to think about how to do it. And they've, and they've dominated it. And of course, the right has no answers to it. So they kind of dominate these issues. The right answer is tradition. It's not very appealing or inspiring or true, right? Because tradition is also when we had slavery. So you can't go backwards. You have to look forward and you have to find solutions. So, so wokeness has capitalized on all real problems and presented these tribalistic, uh, you know, anti-individualistic uh, and, and anti-reason, emotional driven uh, and, and really solutions or ideas based on uh, the you know the kind of adoration of the victim the, the 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 raising the victim to martyr status again very much like religion uh so so I, all the leftists have studied religion and they keep creating these things that are very similar right you have original sin color of your skin is your original sin right and you you, you, you have a, a way to 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 you, have, you know to you go to uh um what do you call it to uh confessional Yes, I'm bad. I'm because I'm because I was born this way, right? I mean, they've got all the trappings of religion. Uh, so uh, I think she would be horrified by how we descended into such an insane low point. But she w maybe she wouldn't be surprised. It is just an extension of kind of uh, your continental philosophy. I mean, you could you could trace woke back to. Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, and ultimately the postmoderns, and 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 it's just postmodernism is applied to some of this other stuff, and it all goes back to to the continental philosophers. Uh, what about in the next ten years? I I don't think they'll be woke in the next ten years. It'll definitely have a different name. The name woke will be gone. Um, they'll change labels, but a lot of and and some of the excesses of it, some of the really absurd stuff will dissipate but some of it will be institutionalized talk about institutions right DEI you know DEI diversity equity inclusion that will become part of the corporate landscape it'll just be there nobody will think twice about it nobody all the quotas will just be there they'll be institutionalized they might not call them DEI we might not call it woke but it'll just be part of life another piece that the left is just you know it's like the welfare state nobody questions the welfare state you say, oh, it should be a little less. Should be a little more. We should give them a little more benefits, a little less benefits. How about zero? Yeah, I know you laugh because it's a little uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm for zero welfare. Right? Uh, but you can't do that anymore because they slowly have taken over with, of course, this. So they'll, of course, be DEI. What, get rid of that? That's impossible. Can't even imagine that. Can't comprehend that. So... Woke will enter into our culture to become a part of our life. We won't even notice it to the point where we won't even notice it, but we will have compromised reality for it, right? Um, and not in every realm. Some realms are too ridiculous to, 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 
to contemplate, but 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 some, and it'll happen differently in different countries. Certainly, America will be continue to be at the forefront of these wonderful evolutionary genes. Hello, uh, my name is John. I'm a local capitalist. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that uh, as long as the U.S. does not correct its mistakes, uh, there can be no peace in the Middle East, for example. Yeah. And uh, that uh, this is caused, or the root of it, um, is due to the double standards. And the double standards seem to be enabled and supported by... Uh, good old American capitalism, uh, because the money has no smell. It's uh, it can be uh, described as simple uh, individual transactions, um, money for fuel, for the ground, for and and who cares where the money goes afterwards? It could go to Hamas or somewhere else. So the question is, if uh, these, if capitalism is unable to correct itself by enabling and supporting double standards. Are we doomed to eternal war in the Middle East? Oh, um, so I disagree with some of your assumptions there, and I certainly disagree with the, what we're dealing with is capitalism here. I don't think we have capitalism in the world. There is no capitalism. We have mixed economies. We have state intervention in everything. We have state controls of everything. And the one thing governments are supposed to do protect us they don't do so you can't blame this on capitalism because there is no capitalism the current system is a fraud it's corrupt it's a disaster on every front and we're experiencing some of the consequence of that but don't blame capitalism and i certainly wouldn't blame money because i don't think it's driven by money i don't think money drives it i think cowardice drives it i think power drives it money is the least problem right um so what, you know, what at the core is going on? Well, start with the fact that America just has no foreign policy. It has no foreign policy. It doesn't know what it's doing. It, it's, it's floundering in the world and has been floundering in the world since the end of World War II. It went on some kind of, you know, couple of anti-communist wars in Korea and in Vietnam. Why? Nobody can tell you. Nobody can explain how America landed up in Vietnam. It was a French war. It wasn't an American war. And yet somehow they landed up there. And it's not about money because America lost much more money than it gained. Nobody benefited from the Vietnam War. A few weapons manufacturers. But in the, in the in total, in terms of who won and who lost, their gain is tiny as compared to all the losses in other industries and other professions and other parts of the U.S. economy. War is a lose-lose proposition. Nobody wins in a war. Not economically, not money-wise. If, if money ruled the world, there would be no wars. Hmm. Um, it went in a war in Vietnam, and then, you know, it was attacked in 9-11. And, and well, its embassy got taken in 1979 in Iran, right? 50 Americans were held hostage. I don't know if you remember this, 4th of November 1979. Americans got, get held hostage in the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. What does America do? Hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. cowards right that's an act of war mm -hmm. that's an act of war should have I mean it should have resulted in immediate military response your job as a government is to protect the lives of your citizen America didn't do that and then I told Khomeini this is relevant for Denmark right I told Khomeini then issues a fatwa in 1980 something 8 I think against Solomon Rushdie and um and, uh, you know, against free speech. We believe in free speech. Yeah, wish we wrote a book. And his publishers attacked in, in the United States. Uh, stores that carry Salman Rushdie's uh, books are, are firebombed. What does the U.S. president say? You know, you really shouldn't write books that are, that are anti-religion. And any Iran, you shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> Defending individual rights of Americans? And, and you just go on and on and on. Like the government's not doing what it's supposed to do. To protect us. And, and then you get the Danish cartoons. And, you know, I couldn't, you, you couldn't show the Danish cartoons. Nobody had the courage to show the cartoons in, in, in America. Because the government wouldn't protect them. They didn't protect the publishers 
in a Solomon Rushdie case, by the way, Solomon Rushdie was attacked recently and almost died. You know, and, and there's no, you know, there's an origin for this. There's a cause for this, and we won't deal with the cause. And we won't even talk about it. So 9-11 happens, and what does America do? It, it goes to one Afghanistan, it tries to build them democracy? I mean, you get killed, so you bring democracy to the world? As if democracy could just be landed like this? It wasn't about money, it was about a, a fantasy that a bunch of intellectuals in Washington had that they could go there and they could build governments and institutions. This is my other thing. Can, institutions are meaningless if you don't have the ideas and the culture for them. And they did that in Afghanistan. And they said, okay, well, we can really make a difference if we do it in Iraq. And I know a lot of people think Iraq is about the oil. But it's really bizarre that if Iraq was about the oil, how come America never got any of the oil? American companies don't own the oil in Iraq. It's Iraqi oil companies. America doesn't get any of the revenue from the oil. It's Iraqi oil companies. America doesn't own the shares in those oil, Iraqi oil companies. And if you were running a war in order to get the oil, wouldn't you protect the oil fields first and take control of them and tell with the rest of the country? No, it was really, I mean, it's hard to believe, but it was really about bringing democracy to the Middle East. And the one party that actually has responsibility for what's going on in the world, on the negative, Iran, because Saddam Hussein was just a thug. I mean, an evil, evil, evil thug. But he wasn't really harming the US, U.S. that much. Iran was. Them you leave alone. You don't touch that. And the one thing you don't do is name your enemy. God forbid you actually say who, who attacked you on 9-11 and who the enemy is. Terrorism. <laughs> That's a coward's explanation. <laughs> not Islamic terrorism. Not jihadi terrorism. Not Islamic totalitarian. You don't find the word Islamo-fascist. You don't want to. You don't want to paint all Islam with the same brush. Absolutely, because not all Muslims are terrorists, right? Not all Muslims are violent. But something to illustrate that this is an ideology derived from a particular religion that is using force and wants to dominate the world. How can you find an enemy you're afraid to name? <laughs> By the way, Hamas right now, same enemy, same war that we've been fighting for a long time, at least since 79. We're still afraid to name them. You almost see no reports about the religious origins of Hamas, the fact that they were, they're, they're basically um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the, the military wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. In, 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 you don't hear, religion doesn't come up. Particularly not in America, because in America, religion is, can't talk about religion. Negative. Just not acceptable. So, America's weak in every sense, and that's philosophy, and that's ideas. It's not capitalism that's a problem. A proper rights-respecting government would have eliminated the threat and gone on with life. And that's what should be done. You eliminate the threat. You don't have to build democracies. You don't have to stay there for 20 years. You eliminate the threat. You make sure it never happens again, and you come home. And you promote free trade, and you promote human prosperity. And you don't go to wars... Don't, you can't win and last forever. I think we have time for just one quick question. Thank you. My name is Sir Thomas Derby. I'm active in the Conservative Party in Denmark. But you said that, that before Enlightenment, the world was ruled by guilds and uh, permissions, I think you called it. So why, why are we now, 250 years after Enlightenment came, starting to do exactly the same, building up new permission societies? I, I, I think that is the great mystery that we need to solve, and, and absolutely. So we're, we're reverting to a pre-enlightenment world. We're reverting to a pre-enlightenment world where we ask permission, where Plato is again reigning supreme in a sense that it, we don't believe, uh, the welfare state assumes you can't take care of yourself. You know, you, you, it assumes that you need other people to, uh, to, to be forced, to coerce to help you, right? We don't even trust that voluntarily they would help you. Uh, so we, we've imposed the philosopher kings on us. We still we pretend we have democracy. I mean, we have democracy in a sense, but democracy is not that great, right? Because democracies allow the majority to oppress the minority. What we really need is a rights protecting democracy, where the majority can't vote on a lot of things. Most things they can't vote on, so it can't take my money, even if ninety nine percent like free speech. We understand, even if ninety. Well, maybe not in Denmark. Certainly not in Sweden, and certainly not in England. In America still, because we have a 
constitution, right? Um, everybody understands in America that even if 99% of Americans vote to silence me, it w- the Supreme Court will say unconstitutional. Can't do it. Uh, the same should be true of our economic liberties and our social liberties and everything else. A democracy should only apply to very, very narrow things. Uh, but for that, we need a, what, what we need today is to resurrect the spirit of the Enlightenment. The spirit of individualism and of reason. And not the kind of, you know, so a lot of conservatives criticize reason as saying, well, didn't the Soviets use reason to, to oppress any scientific socialism? No, that wasn't reason. <laughs> Now, reason is something attached to reality and really uh, where you evaluate what works and what doesn't, facts, evidence, logic. No, that was just, that was just their attempt to, to ag- again, very similar to a, a, a form of religion communism is. Uh, so what we need is to resurrect the idea of, 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 of reason and a proper respect, a proper respect to the individual and his right to his own life and a proper respect for freedom and capitalism. Uh, uh, but... And that means a, a resurrection of the Enlightenment. We need to bring back the, the, the teaching of the Enlightenment thinkers, primarily the Anglo-Saxon thinkers. They were the, they, they were the dominant ones. Uh, and, and, and I would like to see Ayn Rand be in that mix because I think she is, the, she is the inheritor of that intellectual tradition. She, she, she's the continuation of that intellectual tradition. And I think she completes it in some sense. So uh, that, those are the kind of... Yeah, if, if, if the, the battle right now, whether we, whether we acknowledge it or not, the battle right now in the world is between the Enlightenment and the anti-Enlightenment. It's between the Enlightenment and the pre-Enlightenment. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the good is the Enlightenment. And, and the more positive trends in our world today, technology, innovation, those are all products of, of Enlightenment thinking. And you, Enlightenment, what a great yeah, note to end, to end on. Uh, Jan Brooks, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.